The most common type of screw compressor is the rotary screw compressor. This type of compressor utilizes two rotors which are often called helical screws. One screw is designed as the male screw and the other is the female screw. Vapor is drawn into the screw and captured in the space between the screws. The screws are precisely machined so that as the screws rotate, the volume available for the vapor shrinks, which causes the pressure to increase. Screw compressors require oil injection in the compression chamber to provide sealing so that vapor cannot leak backward through the screws. Rotary screw compressors provide several advantages over their reciprocating counterparts. First, they require significantly less maintenance than reciprocating compressors. Instead of implementing routine calendar-based maintenance tasks, predictive maintenance using vibration analysis and oil analysis is often employed on screw compressors. Second, screw compressors typically operate at 3600 RPM compared to 1800 RPM maximum for recips. The increased rotational speed results in higher CFM. In other words, screw compressors can provide higher refrigeration capacity for the same equipment physical size. Third, screw compressors can handle compression ratios as high as 20 to 1, which means they are more versatile and can be used as a single stage machine, whereas reciprocating compressors would require a two stage configuration for the same application. Hey, in this video, I just want to give an overview of a screw compressor. I'm standing here in a machine room, um, and this is an M&M screw compressor package. Right here is the actual screw. If we could, you know, remove the housing and look inside, we would see two uh, mating uh, rotary screws that are meshing together. The suction comes in through the blue insulated pipe um, and then exits, um, exits the screw at a higher pressure and, and temperature, okay? Uh, this here is the motor that has a shaft which is connected to the screw shaft. It's properly guarded here, which is great. This compressor is not operating right now. So, uh, but it's important to make sure that that is in fact guarded like, like you see here, okay? Um, this, this little small motor here is connected to the oil pump. So not every screw compressor will have an oil pump, but many do. Um, oil from the separator down here, okay, is connected to this where it can get go through this trainer and uh, pump through our oil cooler and eventually exit and get returned to the compressor so it can provide lubrication where needed. There's a lot going on there. I'm not gonna go through all of it in this video. Um, but this oil cooler is a shell and two heat exchanger. We have, um, uh, we have liquid ammonia being supplied to it from a thermal siphon receiver through this isolation valve. Um, and the ammonia is what is cooling our oil. Okay, so ammonia exits through the thermal siphon return pipe and then is returned to the thermal siphon receiver. Um, you can see here, um, there's a relief valve on this, a pretty common approach for um, over, protect, over pressure protection on thermal siphon receivers and thermal siphon oil coolers is to use a liquid rated relief valve like, like this one here. Um, next, we've got our relief valve. Every positive displacement compressor is required to have at least one relief valve and due to the size of the oil separator here this one requires a dual assembly and that's what you see here these are parker parker style relief valves which are pretty handy it makes for easier replacement a little less expensive on an ongoing cost so we keep making our way around here um, we're now at where ammonia exits the compressor this is the high stage discharge pipe um, we have a discharge check valve and, a, and an isolation valve uh, so Notice, um, I kind of, I spoke about it earlier, but here's here's what we couldn't see earlier. This is where the ammonia, so ammonia is entering on this blue pipe here, exiting the screw here at a much higher pressure and temperature where it enters the oil separator. This large vessel here we call the oil separator. Now, if we could see inside of this vessel, there would be a filter inside of here, which we call a coalescer. Okay, the coalescer is a filter to keep oil on the screw side of the separator and not let it escape. So by the time it leaves here, it's oil free, theoretically. There's still be a small amount of, a small amount of oil. Um, but um, that's important to understand because if we look at the sight glass, if we walk back to this side. If we look at the sight glasses, we see there are two sight glasses on the oil side. This sight glass here is full of oil. I know it's kind of hard to see because of the strainer, full of oil. And then this one here 
is empty. When in operation, you might see a slight level in here, but it, it wouldn't be full. The coalescer is in the middle here, which is why this side glass on the downstream side of the coalescer should always be should always be empty, uh, like it is shown here. Just a couple other things to point out. Uh, one is the oil heater. Okay, uh, it's a little bit hard to see down here, but but underneath here, there's an electric heating element. Um, that's to make sure the oil stays at a suitable temperature and doesn't doesn't get cold and thick when uh, when the compressor is in standby or not running. Another function it serves is just to make sure that the ammonia vapor doesn't condense inside the uh, oil separator. Okay, and finally, the last thing I want to talk about here is a microprocessor. Essentially, all screw compressors will have some type of microprocessor. This provides the opportunity not only to monitor the equipment, you can see all the different pressures and temperatures, but also to set the safeties on this, on this thing. So um, a lot of functionality goes into this and how this compressor is going to load and unload, when it's going to start and stop. Because compression is accomplished by trapping a volume of vapor between the screws and forcing the vapor to the outlet, it is possible that the change in volume vapor could exceed what is required. This is called overcompression. Overcompression is inefficient, so screw compressor manufacturers have learned to address this issue by designing the screws and outlet port for the exact design conditions. Most modern screw compressors also offer some form of variable volume ratio, which is often called variable VI. Variable VI compressors have a slide valve, slide stop, that moves to change the volume ratio to a precise value matching the system discharge pressure. Some compressors offer fixed variable VI intervals, while others offer infinite values within a range. So unlike reciprocating compressors that have suction and discharge valves to let vapor in or, or let it escape, screw compressors do not have such valves. They have a fixed um, suction and, and discharge and discharge ports that are sized by engineers precisely for whatever the expected loads are gonna be. But in many cases, loads fluctuate or circumstances change and therefore screw compressors can be subject to what we call either under compression or over compression. Over compression occurs when, when the vapor exits the compressor, it's at a higher pressure than the, than the house or the system discharge pressure. Um, and that's a waste of energy, it's inefficient operation and undesirable. Under compression occurs uh, when the vapor reaches the exit point of the screw compressor um, it has not even reached the house suction pressure yet. So it's at a lower pressure. And under compression is not favorable either because we know that flow always goes from high pressure to low pressure. And if this is a lower pressure than the house discharge, we're gonna have some vapor actually enter the compressor backwards. Not a good situation. Um, thankfully, um, engineers and compressor manufacturers have, have uh, resolve this problem by incorporating variable volume control to most screw compressors. Sometimes this is called variable VI, and I've depicted it here by this slide, which I've um, drawn with the, the hashes opposite of the screw. And you can picture in your mind's eye, this, um, this slide moving to the right which would in, in effect reduce the, the volume at the outlet of the screw compressor, right? So if you were experiencing under compression, we can close this down by moving it this direction and, and address that problem. On the flip side, if we're over compressing the vapor, uh, we can adjust the slide to the left, which is going to in effect increase the size of the discharge port. Uh, now, I said we could adjust. In reality, it's not a person making an adjustment here. This is all programmed into the screw compressor microprocessor, so it's happening automatically uh, during operation, which is great. Um, one last thing about the uh, variable BI capabilities is with most modern screw compressors, there's kind of two types and that's incremental where maybe they'll have like three available set points for the, for the volume slide of where it can land three different uh, uh, geometries of the volume at the exit, or a better option is a lot of manufacturers now have an, inf it's an infinite slide, meaning um, it can be at any location uh, within the range or the length of the slide. 
Hopefully that helps to explain variable volume in screw compressors. As its name suggests, a single screw compressor differs from a rotary screw compressor in that it has a single rotor which is configured with a gate rotor on each side. Low pressure vapor enters the compressor and is trapped between the single screw and gate rotor. As the screw spins, the volume of the trapped area decreases which causes the pressure to increase. High pressure vapor exits the single screw at two points that join together before the vapor enters the oil separator.